All right, thanks everybody for joining. I know it's early. Um, I like to make these sessions interactive, so I hope some audience participation is part of it as well. Uh, I, I have a few questions, obviously, like I understand from your perspective how things are going in the industry. I talked to a lot of hospitals uh, over the last few years and over 100 hospitals I've spoken with uh, around reporting analytics as part of the, how they run their HTM or, or clinical engineering organizations. And the topic today specifically is going to be around reporting analytics, ultimately how are you making better business decisions around your healthcare technology management group um, from the data that you're collecting. And that's especially the key. And we'll talk more about you know, how are we better collecting that data and managing that data, ultimately report on that data. So that's the topic of today's session. Uh, so my name is Ben Pearson. Uh, I'm our Vice President of our pre sales Solution Consulting and Product Marketing at Nivolo. Uh, Nivolo is a software a company. It's a modern CMS and enterprise asset management software company. Um, but I'm going to try to focus this more on uh, the business aspects, not the software sales presentation today. So let's we'll dive into the, the agenda for a minute. So first of all, kind of the first thing I'm going to talk about is some of the challenges I see. Most hospitals are managing their reporting through spreadsheets primarily. So if Joint Commissioner DMD comes in, they're using a lot of time spreadsheets to report on that. I'm curious in the room, how many people are using spreadsheets today as part of reporting to the business? Raise your hands. Yeah, about 80% of the room. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how is that, how can we change that going forward? Um, you know, like I said, the goal here is we have data that we can report on, but also collaborate on. Spreadsheets are hard to collaborate on across your business units, up to your executive leadership team. So we'll talk about that. We'll also hit on how real-time reporting and analytics can really help you. How do we actually get that real-time reporting of what's actually happening in the field? Especially for large organizations, if you're the VA or if you're a service provider like UHS or, or whoever, you have a lot of clinical leaders out in the field that are doing work. How do I actually see what's going on out in the field, know how we're doing in terms of completion, compliance, productivity, right, financials? So we're going to talk about that. And then how do we ensure that that data is actually accurate and that we can actually report on it? Uh, so I'll talk about some of the things I've seen from large OEM service providers, global uh, companies as well, on doing data management around your HTM platform and what does that mean and, and, and industry standards that are being used and adopted across the industries. And lastly, I'll actually give you a live demonstration. I'll show you a web and software company. I will show you a little bit about what we do out of the box when it comes to reporting analytics. How do we handle environment of care? How do we handle drug commission reporting? How do we handle that, that you know, compliance reporting, that, that ultimately operations reporting and financial reporting? So we'll cover that as well. Any questions before we get started? Any, hopefully that's what everybody's expecting today. Questions or comments? Feel free to ask questions as I go. Uh, glad, to, glad to handle those today. So let's dive in. So the current state of HDM reporting, Let's talk a little bit about that and what we're seeing. So some of the challenges with this spreadsheet is 80% of you roughly raise your hands, they're using spreadsheets. And some of the challenges with it, it's time consuming, all right? You gotta export data from your current CMMS system. You've gotta take that data and have you figure that data out, sort it, graph it. You know, ultimately as soon as that data is exported, by the way, it's, it's out of date in a lot of cases, right? It's now an extract of your source of truth of data. So it's prone to human error as well. You're now dealing with a subset of data, you're dealing with data that now you're human interacting with uh, to ultimately try to get a business decision out of it. So it is prone to human error. And lastly, it's difficult to collaborate. For me to actually bring somebody else in and look at that spreadsheet, I have to put it on a SharePoint site or put it someplace on a file share for people to actually look at and work with me on that data. So that's another challenge we see when it comes to working with spreadsheets. So, one of the other things that we want to think about is how do we take that data and report it up to my executive team, so my C-suite, what, what do they care about, right? What is the executive team within your hospital, what do they care about, right? They care about their financials, their compliance, right? They care about how you're running as a business. So being able to take that data, and spreadsheets are difficult in some cases, getting that data up to your executive team to show you how is your actual organization running and how do they make better business decisions for how they're running their business. Right? How do they do? I need to hire more HDM technicians or not? Uh, do I have the right skills within my organization? Do we need to put together a program to train and certify or give technicians additional skills across my organization? Are we compliant if a commission walks in the door? Right? So, this is something we want to think about. Getting that real time reporting is one of the ways to get that data up. Question? Yep. 
A key performance indicator. So you guys are doing this behind the scenes, the KPI is just tracking measurement, right? Measuring your, your service delivery as an example. So how long is it taking from a, a staff member opening a correct demand work order to somebody responding to it to ultimately getting completed? How are you measuring productivity of your clinical engineers? That's a KPI. That's a key performance indicator, just examples of them, but that's 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 a basic question. Any other questions so far? Okay, great. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen, I guess why I've been to Amy. So Amy actually puts out a program level of maturity of an HTM organization. So there's three different levels of maturity. And this is where we think about what, what level are you at as a healthcare organization when it comes to the maturity of your, of your HTM organization. So it starts at fundamental. These are basics. This is where we typically see you, you know, just truly just basic operations. Then you have an established organization, and lastly, it's advanced. And these are some of the items within an advanced HTM program that you want to be thinking about as you run your HTM business. So the first one is, are you tracking all of your HTM-related costs? So are, you, are your clinical engineers logging their hours? And are you actually tracking labor rates against those hours to track true costs of service against the work that they're performing? And then some hospitals operate as an internal HTM shop, and some actually operate as a service provider and service other hospitals. The ones that are servicing other hospitals are doing this pretty well because they have to bill out for that work that that hospital they're servicing. But that's the first one. Are you tracking those costs? You're also tracking your parts costs you're spending. So if you are buying from Parts Source or GE Parts or whoever, are you actually tracking all those line items costs of parts? Where are you spending that money? And I'll give a big example. Sutter Health is doing a phenomenal job of tracking that. I was on site with them a couple weeks ago. And um, they're doing an amazing job of actually tracking where's that part spend happening. So um, hospitals have to be tracking those part spends, the labor spends uh, associated with the work that they're doing. The second is, are you monitoring productivity? Are you actually tracking your HDM technician's productivity, meaning how much time are they spending during the day and what are they spending that time on? So basically doing time cards for your HDM techs and you'll report on productivity. One of the things I see is, are you actually comparing technicians against other technicians too? And looking at things like your PMs are performing against a particular model of device. How's one clinical engineer performing against another clinical engineer? Being able to actually compare that, and maybe there's training needs. Why is one engineer doing this PM at half the time, or doing three or four PMs of the same model when one clinical engineer is only doing one? Right? These are things that are happening, but a lot of hospitals and health systems aren't measuring that today. And being able to help those engineers that are either overachieving or underachieving, how do we get the team running at full productivity? Any questions on that so far? Is everybody in the room measuring productivity or clinical engineers? Because yes, there's a few yeses. Yep. Great. Question. So I don't know if this is if you can answer this question, but you said full productivity. So mm -hmm. nobody's going to be 100 percent Correct. Is there a standard of what uh, high level productivity is percentage wise? Yeah, so you also want to track administrative time too, right? You want to track not just uh, sorry. Yes. You don't necessarily there's productivity and then there's actually just accounting for what you did. And that's what Sutter's trying to do. We're just trying to get our text. You know, if, if you were talking with a customer, put it down as well. Mm -hmm. If you were at a meeting about some kind of an upcoming project, put it down as the administrative mm -hmm. meeting. You know, I've heard this from forever that, you know, somebody can't be 100% productive. That's true. Mm -hmm. But you can account for 100% of That's what right. your time is that you spend on one o'clock. Exactly right, Joe. Yeah, thanks for that. Right? Actual wrench time, actually doing the work, and then all those administrative time that Joe mentioned. Yeah, yeah service guys, you know, I'm not going to spend it getting an old change. Mm -hmm. Or getting an <laughs> old I mean, those are all important things. Exactly. Yeah, that's another question back. Yeah, so, uh, more of a comment. I appreciate sure. gold, but uh, uh, whatever, you, whatever you use to measure, your organization needs to uh, adapt, right? And, and, and if you're going to report that out to somebody uh, above you, and that's important when, when you're looking at getting additional staffing, it has to be something that your organization has, has uh, sanctioned, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, 
it won't mean anything to anybody. Yeah, that's a good comment. So if folks in the room, it's really about standardizing that too and making an enterprise-wide decision that has to be adopted enterprise-wide to your point. We can't have one hospital doing one thing, another hospital doing another. It is a, an executive level decision that has to be pushed down and, and adopted across the board. Yeah, great. Any other comments on that? Like, like the collaboration, good guys, good stuff. Um, the next piece, which ties into your current CMMS platform or enterprise asset management platform, does it have the capabilities as well to do that analytics and reporting? This is coming from Amy. Um, they are recommending that you are looking at a more modern platform that does have data reporting and analytics. You know, the question I always ask is, do you have to call the vendor or call in a reporting developer to build a report to make a business decision? Hopefully the answer is no. If the answer is yes, then you should be looking at another more modern CMS platform. <laughs> modern platforms have that capability. You guys let a bunch of years can build your own reports, run your own analytics against it. It's around integration capabilities. So if you're running, for example, an RTLS system, a real-time location services RFID system in your hospital, is that tied into your CMS platform for asset location information. So that's something that we do have. So that way now you know not only what devices you have, but also where are they at in near real time as they're moving around your hospitals, so your fusion pumps and your mobile uh, you know, heart monitors, et cetera, that have tags on. So tying that in, but also tying it in with things like your financial system. We talked about tracking costs. Well, tracking costs is also part of tying in with your loss and your SAP or your Oracle system. So now you not only know what did you pay for these medical devices in your hospital, but what's the true total cost of service against those medical devices? So you can start planning for things like capital, uh, capital forecasting and capital planning. Joe, I'll give you a shout out. You're actually going to do a presentation on Sunday uh, around capital forecasting and planning. And these are the kind of things you can operationalize in a modern platform of being able to have so you can actually forecast the replacement of devices. Uh, you can also do things like purchase order requests or invoicing from your CMMS as well with that integration capability. So if you are servicing another hospital or you're a service provider, being able to automate that invoicing process through its entire life cycle. So that's another capability along with parts and parts ordering as well. So things like parts orders and other systems. Are you doing any asset reliability tracking? So are you tracking how reliable your medical devices are? How often are they failing or having faults? Like raise the hands, who's tracking that today in the room? About 15% lower number. So you know, that's something to think about as well. Are you actually keeping track of how reliable your medical devices are? How are they failing? Right? That way now you also have that as a measure against the reliability of your overall assets. So if you think about buying decisions, now you know not only what they cost from you, but also what's the reliability of them and how, how, how you know, functional are they. And lastly, are you driving a self-service model in your hospitals? Are you allowing staff members to report back to your clinical engineers for problems through self-service? Or are you still in a bit of a legacy model where the staff member picks up the phone and calls a primary or secondary tech that's stickered on the device, which I still see quite often. So that's another model we're wanting to see. Amy's wanting to see more clinical engineering move towards a self-service model where staff members can truly report their problems themselves uh, without having to re-pick up the phone and call someone. Okay. Any questions on this list? Again, this is straight from Amy. Uh, just was curious if everybody's aware of these top items. Again, this is what gets you to that advanced maturity level when we think about the overall uh, HCM program level. Um, that's a question. Okay. One of the things I want to talk about, I'm just throwing an example picture up here, but this is a UDI barcode. Um, it's all about the data. It's really all about the data when it comes to reporting and analytics. I can talk about reporting and all this, but reporting is only as good as the data that you have within your system, right? So the key for, for me, and this is one of the challenges when I talk about customers looking at data standardization across your organization. The VA is an example, not to pick on the VA, but they have so many different systems and there's not a standard across the VA for things like asset types, models, manufacturers, et cetera. When you think about reporting, if I'm not standardizing across my enterprise, how do I actually report across the enterprise? So this is a really foundational item that hospitals and health systems have to think about, is how do, what is our, what is our data standard? Just like we talked about the standardization around labor time, time entry, the same is true for data standardization. So I'll just talk about some of the items that I'm seeing hospitals adopt 
across the country and internationally. Um, one is ECRI's unique medical device naming standard. So ECRI has a, a naming standard. Um, hospitals are adopting this. It is a fairly complex naming standard, so we do see a lot of hospitals modifying their UMDNS or ECRI standard naming conventions across their medical devices. It's pretty common, uh, but it is pretty widely used. Uh, as you may or may not know, the FDA mandates any medical device sold in the United States has a unique device identifier. And that's what that barcode is on the right hand side. So when you get a medical device shipped into your hospital, it has a unique device identifier attached to it, at least here in the United States, that you can actually scan uh, when you're doing your inventory and onboarding of that medical device that now can auto classify it back to the UBI. We are seeing hospitals start to move toward that as a standard since it is a required for any medical device sold in the United States. Um, uh, I am seeing internationally that uh, some companies and service providers, even OEMs, are looking at this in the GMDN, Global Medical Device Naming Standard, is tied to the UDI. Uh, so GMDN is one standard that I'm starting to see being adopted from an international perspective. So I just wanted to share that. There's no one size that fits all here, you guys. So I'm not prescribing anything specifically. I'm just sharing uh, options that are kind of I'm seeing in the, in the industry. Another one um, is BDNA Technopedia. Uh, they are a BDNA is a company that was acquired by Flexera. Um, they have a standard manufacturer model uh, repository database that they maintain. We are seeing some health systems adopting that as their standard. And then lastly, I'll just, I'll just mention it is barcoding standards. Some hospitals aren't even barcode tagging their assets. Some are, more and more are. Uh, but we see internationally and here, so looking at GS1 as a barcode standard, what it is, it's a unique barcode that is truly a global unique identifier barcode standard that you can issue those from GS1. So any feedback on here? Anybody want to talk about their experience with ECRI's uh, uh, UMDNS naming standard? Or I'm curious if anybody's using any of these standards today or anybody wants to share in the room. Okay, we're hands up, hands back. Yep. You do? Great. Great. It seems like that's more, more prominent. Yeah, go. You use ECRI and UDI to some extent. We're starting to use UDI. With ECRI, they have like categories and then subcategories. Yeah, it's complex. What is the general, like are most people just using the general categories yes. or the detailed subcategories? Because we struggle with using a mishmash of bill based on what somebody chose in the device data. Yeah, um, I'll let some other hospitals sh share their feedback. I'll give you my two cents, but anybody else have a comment on that? Anybody using? Yeah, go ahead. We use UCI as an archive, and that's actually really helpful for basically taking segments within your asset portfolio and trying to better understand certain things that are going on there, especially when we're starting to do some bigger planning and we need to work directly with sourcing managers to let them know what's in the system in regards to a particular subtype. That's an easy way to pull them. Like if I want a hemodialysis unit, I can pull a hemodialysis unit because of the ECRI and stuff. Mm -hmm. It does get a little convoluted at times, and you're, it's not going to make perfect sense. But I actually came from, I was a surgical services product analyst. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather look at hemodialysis units than stem. Um, and when you think about GS1, there's something called unspec. Unspec is the product categorization that actually goes through you kind of up to eight levels of hierarchy. So from that perspective, ECRI categories and subtypes are pretty good. Great. Thanks for that, Justin. I appreciate that. Yeah, go ahead, The problem that I have with the ECRI is uh, I have a really, to me, an aspirator, you can sometimes use the OR or you know, an aspiration tube or something like that. So I'm trying to find a breast pump. I'm uh, not making press aspirator. Mm -hmm. And they have used, I would say, it's been dry like clinical engineers thinking on this clinical engineering level. Uh, to me, my customers don't care if it's a spiral CT mm -hmm. or if it's a five point CT or whatever kind of CT. They just want to know how many slices they can get. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it doesn't break it down into that, so you have to create another field of wonder of the 64, it's the 15, it's the 8, it's the 4. Because when they walk in for capital for replacement, I want to, I want to upgrade all of my uh, CTs that aren't 64 to 64. And then you're sitting there trying to figure, well, it's a spiral one, a, a 
a six feet or seven eight. Mm -hmm. Not one of those two. So it's a good point, Joe. And tracking those attributes associated with it is well important. You're right from a reporting perspective to now make capital planning decisions based on it, right? Yeah, yeah. great. And Joe, you, you looked at a couple of different options here specifically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other comments or questions on this? I just thought this was a topic I personally get asked a lot. Uh, you know, really around that data standardization. Any customers are asking us how do how do how does Novo help customers with that? How do we help standardize? So I'll just share that really quick. We out of the box already have the FDA GDIs in our platform. So you can actually standardize against those if you'd like to have the choice. We also have an integration with ECRI, UMDNS, you classify against that as an option as well. And it's an open API platform, so you can integrate with the other two as well from barcoding standard and, and BDNA technical PDA standard. Another question? I think the point is yeah. you gotta use something. You do. If, if you're not doing this, So as soon as that mobile device doesn't have connectivity, 
because the hospital maybe doesn't have Wi-Fi or there's no signal depending on what device you're using, it becomes a, a brick at that point and useless device, right? So um inventory. Yeah. Right. But after that, yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. We have seen that in the industry that that is a challenge. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that. I'm, I'm going to do a brief demonstration. Our mobile platform is online and offline. So it's really synchronized with your work locally. So if you lose connectivity, you can still do your PM. You can create assets in this, you know, just update asset inventory, order parts. All that can be done even offline. So that's one of the key things that we chose to do to address that issue um, of connectivity challenges within hospitals. So, great. Okay, so let's dive in. I just want to, how are we doing a time check? I'm just curious. Doing good? We got 30 minutes left? Okay. All right, we got plenty of time. All right, great. Any questions before I kind of jump in? I actually do want to show you some of this. I just want to talk about all this. I'd like to demonstrate some of this with you all. But any last topics or any other challenges you guys are faced with when it comes to reporting and analytics besides the things I've already covered? Just to open this up a little bit to the team here in the room. Comments or questions? I think the biggest challenge is uh, getting our staff to stop people. Uh, I don't care who you are. Uh, it comes down to the individual that you hire and uh, what their commitment is in the organization. So, so uh, I think that's the biggest challenge that we need to talk to you about. That, that I think is making sure my staff is consistent with how they got and what they got and what they got. And how are you, is there a process that you're training your technicians on to mandate certain processes? Are you adjusting your CMS to mandate certain things are filled in before they close the work order? What, how are you addressing that? We do have certain things that they can't close the work order until they enter data into this block or that block, things like that. But uh, it's, it's not the individual who does the Sure. Or 
more about it. The automation means that the backup is a responsibility. Why is it responsibility? Is it alerting the manager up above to get the, the, the thing in here to get him to close it out by his input? I mean, yes. he can't take any more work for it as a result, and he's less productivity, he's sort of more flag, right. and he started tracking people's ability to do their work. <laughs> Functionally, or more functional. Is that something that gets done in the world? Yes, it is. So uh, we mandate certain fields are filled in prior to closing a work order. You can't close a work order without those fields being populated. Uh, we can require a certain amount of text is added, for example, of what they actually did. So if it's they've said fix, uh, they can't close the work order. Right, right. So we can mandate a certain string length of text. Uh, so yes, that, yes, I can show that to you. You yeah, one of the things we are seeing is uh, healthcare organizations are putting up a dashboard on the wall. Uh, kind of what you see with grounding dashboards uh, where HTM teams actually have in their room a TV with productivity measures, who's been doing what sort of that uh, competitive nature of people, uh, how many work orders and go ahead, yeah, comments. And that's in development. Yeah. Yeah. Dashboard. Exactly. Yeah, they can just put our dashboard up on the TV and show it. And that's one thing we are saying is just yeah, you know, like, don't like the <laughs> So appreciate it. And at that point, you know, are, are we ever gonna get to a world that says every device, whether it's a pump or a cat lab, the clinician marks it out of service, this is broken. And it won't go back to service. That dispatch is closed because they have to do those functional checks to put it back in to work on human. <coughs> that, that would probably draw a lot of attention from C suite to say, look, this clinician put this gap lab out of, out of service. Mm -hmm. It is go back into service until you check it out and put it back in service electronically, physically, not dashboard. Yeah. yeah. There's a human aspect of that that I don't know that uh, technology is going to solve. So the comment from the folks in the back was, is there any way that technology can mandate that if a device is uh, chosen to be out of service, that it can't accidentally get put back or chosen put back into service without it actually being correctly maintained, uh, work orders closed, it's now available for service to putting patients back on the device. That's hard. Um, you know, with, with technology to be able to do that. Um, because the device itself, somebody physically could take back into the room and, and use without any knowledge of of that of that the hard tie back that work order, right? So that is a bit of a challenge. I don't know if there's an easy answer. Unless the OEM comes up with a solution that would truly block out the device and the HTM has to be able to authenticate log into the device somehow. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. That's a good question, though. Yeah, is there a common question back? Assigned to that asset, that an apology procedure that we follow that says you can't pull it out unless you scan that RFID and can give you all the history on it and say, yep, that's what it's from there. I will act and take away that, you know, obviously, you don't need to do this. Right. That's the other question. You could. I mean, that would be an option, right? And we have that capability of seeing RFID tags as part of servicing it. So that's an option. Yeah, if there's another question or comment here. Uh, back to using your thoughts team of as the tools and manage technician behavior. Mm -hmm. We have a process in our CMS where the work orders are reviewed or new assets that technicians add. If they're missing, they go up through an approval process. Mm -hmm. Where it falls short is then the manager's ability to mount it back to the technicians. And it's an interesting mm -hmm. function that sort of we have and is not fully fleshed out, but being able to take those work orders back for re review. Mm -hmm. Sort of building up the technicians to you is a less confrontational feedback loop for adding more detail or finding more orders that are deficient or which fields you didn't include. Sure. Are you doing that on all work orders? Is a subset of work orders that go through a manager review? Because I do see that in a lot of hospitals. Well, add that as okay. any work order that's been pulled in off review, which is sort of a manager's record. So okay. you automatically they don't get reviewed because we don't have the bandwidth to manage a review of every work order. Sure. But we can take a spot check and. Yeah, not in that way. Right. 
Yeah, and, and so the answer is, so is it assigning it up to the manager, and then you want to see the assigned yeah. access yeah. access which wants to review that. And then we can show that they then reviewed and found a problem, but we can't take it back to the technician. Mm -hmm. It's our yeah. it's in but uh, uh, so yeah, we mentioned the behavior. We didn't do that, and maybe some of you talked to some use cases there, we get time to that. Oh, I didn't catch up afterwards, I can show you how that might work. Um, I have a lot of comments in the room, yeah. Go ahead. Um, what I was going to say is, we're talking about RFI. Mm -hmm. Okay. In real time reporting, I know that uh, the follow is, and, and even without the follow up, we're looking at there's two products out there. I know that probably a year two products, and not those are two of them. They're also able to take a look and see what's on your network, your network devices. Mm -hmm. And sort of this really comes in that you need to know. And, and, and as you're talking about stuff here, my guys, my managers, and some of them are here in the room, don't have time to sit there and review technicians' uh, reports, their FSRs, or PM. What we're trying to incorporate into our system uh, that we have at a certain point is experience. We set up the parameters. So when something falls outside of those parameters, you're notified of that. If something falls within certain parameters, it's a go and you can mm -hmm. right on through. Because you're, you need to start managing by uh, variation or thing of variances rather than, you know, uh, to me, the expectation has always been to get 100% of your PMs. So to run a report to show that I'm at 100% or what I've got done, that's not important to me. What's important to me is what hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. And so what I was talking about as far as like the zinc box and cloud posts, cybersecurity is getting really big. Mm -hmm. You want to know when a device disappears, it's got PHI on it, where did it go? Mm -hmm. And that's some more real time reporting that you want, I want to know about is when something you know, disappears off my network, where did it go? Is it down in the shop and somebody's got to turn off and it's torn apart so they can't speak? Or is it uh, disappeared out of my hospital and it's got 500 bottles on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's completely valid, Joe. And we can uh, talk more about cyber as well as a separate topic. It is definitely important, right? I think about one cry coming out last year. Um, by the way, back to data classification and knowing where your devices are, that data information, tying with your real-time location information, knowing where it is, what's the state of it, right? What's the condition of it? And, and obviously tying in with even some of these new cyber offerings like the box file post, the stimuli, mitigate, there's just a lot, right? Um, that's another key to the solution. And actually managing because your source of truth is your medical devices and the inventory that exists within your CMMS or EAM system, right? So that is definitely an important piece in solving some of the cyber challenges uh, that I know you're all looking at faced with. Uh, another comment? Yeah, I just want to go back to this gentleman's comment. Sure. You know, the nurse takes it out, uh, calls it a word for her. Mm -hmm. The medical industry, like there have been any talk about time mm -hmm. where. Uh, you know, the nurses scan that piece of equipment before it's used to the tie to that patient's record. And if there was that tie in, then the third work order open, then that big flag and say, hey, we can't do. Uh, so there, there is. So we talked about Epic and Cerner integrations as a topic that comes up. Um, PHI and HIPAA is always part of that conversation as well. I'll be honest with you, Epic and Cerner are two applications that don't like applications looking into them. As, and then rightfully so, right? Uh, it's very protected data. Um, but we are seeing things like um, device availability. So we know that a patient is scheduled on this CT scanner at this date time. So now we're not dealing with room and availability when it comes to doing PMs. Um, so how do we get some of that device to availability data into my CMMS system? Uh, that is a topic of conversation that we do have. Um, so I would say that's probably going to be an outbound email integration from your EHR into Nivolo. Uh, to be able to get that data. Uh, it won't be bi-directional, it won't be typically the other way, uh, because most EHRs don't want us pushing information or updating information to them. And rightfully so, right? Uh, they're sensitive to that, as I can just do that. Um, any other comments on that? Yeah. For the most needed mark today, you do have a patient device association yes. going on. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so there's a lot of sensitivity around that topic, um, but we are, uh, the email integration option is probably the most logical for us, coming from your EHR to us with just device and scheduling information. 
is the main use case I've seen today. Yep. Good question. Any other topics? All right, how are we doing in time? We've got a half hour left, lots of time. Good. There's some of the stuff we have out of the box. I also want to show uh, mobile as well. So let's let's dive in. You know, I, like, I love the collaboration, so let's just keep talking. I think it's uh, good for us. I like to hear from other hospitals and health systems, too, of how you're doing it. So I want to talk about mobile first, actually. I'll full screen this out. You guys can also see my screen. Yeah, All right. So, so our mobile technology, as I mentioned, does work online and offline. So right now I'm connected to my mobile interface so I can actually see my PMs, my correctives, I can have dashboards and reports. Um, so this is this is our mobile interface and it really stores on my iPad, my Android, or on any mobile device. It's on the app store and actually installs. We intentionally developed this uh, so G Healthcare, Stevens Health and who are our large customers that you can call up. Um, and they needed this functionality globally uh, to manage their customers uh, because that connectivity challenge exists you know, all over the place. So this truly stores my information locally. I can actually access my work orders, my assets, in any condition. If I have lost connectivity, I can still look at my data. Um, the goal here is data accuracy from a clinical engineering perspective, but also speed. My goal is that the comment was back here around how do I make sure that my clinical engineers are entering all this information. But from a clinical engineering perspective, all I care about is I'm getting my work done. I'm Fixing devices and getting them back to the hospitals to be able to be used on patients in the most efficient, effective manner possible. So I have to make their jobs easier at completing work orders, but still get the data that leadership needs back so you can report on how's your team doing and what are they actually doing, right? So I'll talk a little bit about that barcode scanning. So walking up and scanning a barcode it could be RFID, could be another. So we did have this. So if you walk up and verify this is actually the device I'm working on. I'll scan the device. So this gives me all the current work orders against this device. This is a unit pump I just scanned. So let me try to talk about a little bit about a couple of things we put in here. So I just scanned a barcode of the device. This verifies that I'm actually the technician working on that device and that specific device. I didn't grab the wrong work order for the wrong device. So you have to have that data validation, but also speed to get this thing done, right? So from an engineer, sorry, from a technician perspective, it's easy, it's quick, it's fast and validates it that I'm actually working on the right device, right? Um, are you guys do how many people are using barcode tags on their medical devices? It's like almost everybody. And are you having your technicians do a scan of that device when you actually work on that device? Looks like about a very small fraction of the group, so about three people. Um, so Something to think about. The technology exists. You guys can do that. Like I said, if you're doing rounds or you're doing inspections, we start seeing that a lot more of that. Uh, being able to quickly walk up, scan, do your check, get a checklist again, get your inspection checklist, go on to the next scan, the next. We are starting to see that type of model being implemented. A couple of things we added to start through is in the upper left here, you'll see a start button. It's a blue, little blue circle. Um, the goal here is that I made it easy for that technician to start their labor tracking of actual wrench time on the work order. I don't want them to have to remember I spent an hour and 20 minutes or 15 minutes working on this device. This is tracking true wrench time as it's running. It's actually automatically creating a labor entry on this work order for that technician so that when they close this work order, it auto stores the labor they spent working on this work order. So that's another capability. You can still manually enter labor entries or adjust them, but this gives you a speed of labor entry for your clinical engineers. So if somebody comes in, interrupts you, and you walk away, and it's still running to the back. You can edit it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can pause it. Too. I can pause it while I'm going. I can uh, adjust now if I restart. It's going to create another labor entry, so I can start stop as I go throughout my day. So if I had to, you know, step away for lunch and come back and work on it after lunch, I can do that. And it adds those two line items to labor now for that technician. Multiple technicians can work on the same work order in here and add their own labor entries using the same capability. You can collaborate if you need to have multiple tech working in a single work order. You can do that. There are questions on that so far. Questions back? A couple questions. Yep. Uh, question. So, as you, as the technician is going to provide service or piece of equipment, mm -hmm. there's some prep time about print, uh, making the way to the equipment, assembling the right tools, mm -hmm. uh, interacting with staff to get some additions. How does the Volo or anybody else factor in that time frame as far as the support for that equipment? Yeah, 
so you, the, the question to the room is how do you add in those additional times if I'm doing, I have to prep parts or I have to find, get up, obtain parts or I need to travel to the site to get to actually service this device. That really goes back to that productivity reporting conversation we had earlier. You, hopefully you're going to be creating line items for those additional administrative items as part of performing this work order. So if I have travel time, if I have part prep time, if I have, uh, maybe I have to locate the manual for this device, whatever it is, you're wanting to keep, keep track of those. That's what, those are additional entries you're going to create over here on our time entry sheet, where you're actually going to be putting a time card entry on this work order against those additional administrative items. Thanks for the technical
more value than that than seeing every single hour of our engineering time. So when it comes to pump season, we've got engineers that have 200 percent legal space. That's the difference in this team and that we think. And if that's what I think everybody really needs to think about, this is the tool. We are people. We need to create our own governance outside of the school and ensure the school facilitates our success. And then certain things like being able to figure that out, figuring out what your criteria is for appropriate medicine. This is not being called that for the business decision to make around that. And to your point, you're wanting to track, like you said, productivity around you want to actually measure what it really takes pump by pump. And so that's a good comment. I actually like that. Any other comments or feedback? I think other possible analysis would probably think of things the same way. Yep. I well, just want to add on what Justin was saying. We had the same issue. They all move back to pumps. Mm -hmm. At the time, we made the opposite business decision you did initially, because at first it was about compliance of the technician. Sure. But as time went on, our model changed. And once the technician became more compliant, we said, Okay, now it's more important for us to understand how much time we're actually spending on the client. So don't be afraid to change that governance decision as time goes on and your emphasis or your focus is on something different. And, that's, and you know, all we see in the map is our great tools, but it does come down to government, governance, and what's important to you to build your to change. Yeah, great comment. Any other comments in the room? Good discussion points. I like it. Okay. All right. Skip on the uh, you think we've got time to get got 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Well I'll jump to reports then. Let's do it. So this is what are we here for? All right. Let's jump out of here. All right. So Let's talk about reporting analytics. Let's see how that looks on the screen. It's a little small. Let's zoom in a little bit. All right. Let's see if I can make that a little larger for you all. So I'm going to walk through some reports and dashboards for you all. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things we are tracking in the platform out of the box. And you guys can give me feedback. I'm curious as to all your feedback on this, actually. So what I'm going to start with is operational reporting. And then I'm going to move into compliance reporting, then financial reporting, and I'll talk a little about department level reporting. So kind of how you actually look at health of different surgery departments or different departments that you're working on. So I'll dive into those areas. I'm going to start first with operations. And you know, for me, this this is where you really you're looking at that productivity information. Um, so let's let's actually look at this. So like for example, I want to see unassigned work for my week of all my engineers, being able to locate that type of information. What about overdue PMs, right? And this is all live data. So as someone's doing a PM out in the field, seeing what's actually, what's what's behind schedule, what's ahead of schedule, I can drill in and click into any one of these and actually get access to this data. This is live or portable data. It's not sitting in a spreadsheet, for example. So here I can see all my PMs, for example, that are that are overdue or, or out of date. Yeah, I'll zoom in a little more. Got it, thanks. All right, so let's go back in. One other area I want to talk about is also around competency. So I'm, I'm curious as to how, what level you're tracking competency within. When I mean competency, who's competent to work on what devices within your hospital? Are you guys mainly tracking that today? Are you doing any automation around that? Knowing these and clinical engineers can actually work on these models of devices because they've worked on it for a certain amount of time. How are, how are you guys doing competency tracking today? I'm just curious to show you. Um, uh, we have a new thing. Yep. 
we're on contract or do I want to take off the contract? And we work it from there. Then anytime somebody gets off the school, they go out a request, they go off the school, they come back and they get an email, then they put in the check email, yes, I completed that, Got it. and then it updates that school and everything like that. Okay. Right. Great, great example. I'll, I'll walk you through this. So we, we do that all automatically. What are they already confident in? But as they're doing work orders against that model of device, we automatically track that, and now we add them to a competency report that they are confident after a period of work orders that they've completed. So I'll show that here in a second. That's all automated. So if you do have an employee leave away in your hospitals, you know what they were confident in. You know who else was confident in that across your health system. Maybe you cross train or get or shift employees around across your locations. I'll demonstrate that here next, but I thought that would help if you handle that example. Yeah, that talk with the nomination. Yep. Is, and then this is where it is. They're taking care of the, uh, the equipment. Mm -hmm. Are you going in there, whether it's called in the manufacturer or not? Oh, good point. So the comment that Joe's making is how confident are they really, and do you have enough data to decide if they really are confident? They may close that work order for that particular model of device, but they didn't actually do the work. They actually called an OEM. Uh, we can handle that, Joe, because we do track if it was subbed out or use a third party to complete the service. Uh, so we could mandate that, but it is a business process that was made earlier. There's a business governance you have to put around that, right? So I want to come somebody's confident tracing CP while they're going to talk to you. Sure, of course. That's right. Yeah, absolutely valid. Yeah. Come on, Jim. Is anybody using an LMS to actually keep track of your certifications or OEM training? You are? Is it working well? Okay. Have you looked into that? Yeah, so we tie into LMS systems to make sure you have a skills and competency tracking within here. So we either tie into your existing LMS, so as a technician goes through certification and training, uh, we actually can bring that data in. We have a certification and skills tracking as part of our skills and skills management module uh, that now you can actually report against it. So, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. The entire. Yeah, you can do it in our CMMS, or if you have this external one, you can do it either way. You can do it both ways. Yep. Is there a reason why we track people's training and stuff as far as CEO comes in? Environment support. Mm -hmm. Because we have a goal that we want to send everybody off for at least two training episodes or situations, even discounts in the training. So, yep. we have the people that are here from Southern today, we had with your application, we told out that you want to come to this course. Symposium, and uh, that gets logged in there mm -hmm. so that we can go back and use that for other reasons besides just you know, training one um, that we brought you with other. Awesome. I'll, I'll show, uh, I think I'll show a little bit more here while we're in here just to give you guys a quick look at this. So I'll give you an example. So let's say a technician, I want to, I can actually see what their competence. So this is a report that shows all my modalities of devices by technician. So if I want to pick, for example, I can pick myself, I guess. Let's see what I've got in here. Here I am. So you can actually select the tech in the upper chart and this auto adjusts. Let's say I don't have any certifications. Let me stick with somebody else. <laughs> Live demos. I love, right? So here we go. I pick this technician. Here I can see now quickly. I picked the wrong person. Here we go. Every model that I work on and how many work orders I've worked against the models of devices. So this gives you a quick look. I can pick my tech and see immediately all the models that they've actually worked on. And I can drill in, by the way, and see the work orders behind this too. So to see if they actually subbed it out to GE or didn't actually do the work, you could audit, you could audit that too. What about skills? This is about skills and certification tracking. This is tech by tech. Now I can see tech by tech. What skills do they have? Like have they done CT repair or have they done you know imaging or infusion pump? Now you can actually do that skills tracking back to an LMS certifications, for example. Um, what else do I have? And I can sort this, split and sort this by user, by site. Maybe I want to see this by site. So here I can see potentially each of my hospitals, each of my locations, and what skills do I have at each of my hospitals and locations. So I can actually compare that as well. Uh, certifications are the same thing. Let me show one other report here while I'm in competency. So this is really getting into drilling now into the details of competency across your organization. This is just one example of, uh, like I said, there's a few different sample examples for competency tracking. So let me go into, this one now gives you true work order level details by model. And I can print this off. I think if you have to actually print and track, you can do that as well. So I actually I drill into myself 
I can see all the models, and now I can drill into this model. Here's a work order that was performed against this particular device, so I have that level of, of tracking as well. So we have that level of detail. Okay. Um, I'm just going to show a few more last reports. I think we're almost at time. Everybody, I appreciate all the comments and questions. Hopefully, this is uh, valuable to you all. I like the collaboration in the group here. So, a few other things I'll hit on. We talk about, um, you know, a couple other ones. So, yep, let's go there next. Perfect. Good question. Let me do. Uh, let's do that. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have your financial report, Joe. I I'm looking forward to that. You guys can attend that session tomorrow. Um, so financial report, here's the financial reporting dashboard. So for example, as part of this, I can track a contract. So as part of this, I also track actuals coming into your contract. So these contracts are either, if you're a service provider, and actually servicing hospitals and billing out for those services, you can track your customer contracts. You can also track your vendor contracts. So if you've outsourced the GE, you can track those contracts as well. And you track actuals coming into those contracts based on the devices and the entitlements. So then you can actually understand what's the return on investment of those contracts. Am I making money on my customer contracts? Am I saving money on my vendor contracts, for example? We do track that. We also track all your travel costs, labor costs, parts costs. Month over month, you can trend that. You start seeing, you can sort by hospital locations, this is all live data, so I can actually see spend across parts and labor and uh, even facility level tracking. This report up here on the upper right, this is tracking um, condition assessments. So looking at, looks like by model here, I've got, you know, what state your device is in, which ones need to be replaced. So you look, yeah, I can track technician by model as well. Yep, yep, exactly. Let's see if I have a few others, capital planning, like I said, uh, what about parts spend by manufacturer and department? So where are you spending money on parts? Is part source one of your main uh, buyer? Are you buying from part source? And understand the cost associated with that. Um, again, this is like the, this is some of the financial reports out of the box. We have over 100 reports. So if there's any other specific reports you want me to talk about, we can hit on it. But I think we're pretty close to the time. Do a bench stock report? Do a bench stock report? Inventory stock? Right. Yeah, so we, yeah, we do. Uh, so that's really going to talk about not parts inventory and asset inventory, you want to do both? Yeah, so we have both. So we track parts all the way down to stock room level and bin level. Uh, so we also do the transfer orders and purchase orders of parts as well. So you can set up replenishment thresholds and auto trigger purchases or transfer of parts. Uh, the hospital down in Texas that's using us just for that, just for their warehouse management. Uh, so that way when, uh, so they run like kind of a hub and spoke parts management model. They have one central warehouse and they have all their uh, regional hospitals that they have uh, stock rooms in. So what we have set up is automation around that. As those regional stock rooms replenish and their parts are being used on work orders, um, it auto replenishes those parts inventories and then triggers once a, a threshold is hit for a replenishment amount to trigger a transfer from that main central warehouse. We also set up automation around the central warehouse to auto trigger purchase orders to replenish the central warehouse from a, a New York piece system like Lawson at the normal. I hope that answered that question. Yep. What about the customized reports and what limitations do you have? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so reporting is self-service. So if I want to customize a report, let's just maybe just do one live if you want to see one. Let's do it. Um, so this is one of the value propositions of the platform. So let's say I want to report, maybe I want to, let's, let's edit this report. So I'll actually go into the self-service reporting. Uh, of the platform itself. So here I'm in my report editor, which by the way, you guys can all do yourself. Don't have to call a vendor or a, or someone else. So let's say I, I like this report, but I want to adjust it. And I don't want it trended by a month. I want to trend it by, I want to trend it by quarter. And maybe I want, instead of a bar chart, maybe I want it to be a pie chart. Uh, let's do that. I don't know. I'm just thinking, thinking out loud, you guys. So let's run one here real quick, see what that looks like. So truly does have full self-service reporting. I can modify reports based on any data in the platform. So you look at your work order data, your parts data, your asset data, and you're going to run a report against it. And there's 20 different report types, including multi-level pivot charts. So it truly gets you out of spreadsheets. That's the that's the objective there with the reporting module. So hopefully that gives you a quick look. If there's anything you want afterwards, I can give you a deeper dive in that. Can you click data? Like, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
I got, so if I want to do like a list report, for example, so let's just do that. Do, 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 do. Cool. Let's see. What else I've got here? Let's do bar chart. So data. So if we look at the data elements that we're bringing in, let's go into that. So right now, um, my source is what table am I pulling from? So in this case, I'm looking at itemized costs. I'm doing cost reporting in this one. Um, but I could be looking at, I could really looking at work orders. Let me just drill into a few other reports for you. So I can literally pick what table I'm pulling that data from. So I could be doing work order data. So clinical work orders or different, you know, past reports, asset reports. So you can pick your table. You pick your chart, and then you decide what the fields you want to pull from those tables. All right, can we create a joiner and union on the fly? Yep, and they already have that. So you can actually, it's a relational database. So you can actually relate tables across as well. Most of our tables are already related. So meaning you can actually walk from one table into another. So for example, I can walk from a work order table into an asset table and pull fields from asset, for example, off of the work order. So almost all of our tables are joined already. Um, we connect to them in either direction. Asset to work order, work order to asset, work order to parts, et cetera. Do you know? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I gotta find out for you on that. Uh, any other questions? Okay. All right. Uh, feel free to give me feedback. I'm always open for positive and negative feedback. Uh, so feel free. Let's uh, like I said, we have a booth. Uh, out on the floor, feel free to stop by. We can deep dive any of these other areas you want to talk more about. Uh, but I appreciate everybody's time today, and thank you. Uh, hopefully, a good session for you all to kick off your day. Thank you.